Hello, I'm Lenina Dasul, your host on Mental Health Matters, a show where we sit down every week with a mental health professional to speak about all things mental health and more. And today we are speaking about substance abuse disorder, or as it's more commonly known as addiction. Now, there are many reasons why people start using substances and the many ways that they become addicted. But aside from the physical effects on our bodies and our health, there are other effects that are very rarely spoken about, which is the distortion of behavior and also the disruption to families. After the break, we are going to be speaking to a representative from the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center, which is an outpatient rehab. I didn't even know there were outpatient rehabs before I found them. And we're going to be speaking about how families can manage the drug addiction as well as support the user who is abusing the substance. But before that, let's have a look at a short video about the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center and what they do, as well as some narrative that was produced in 2020 about how to be in lockdown with someone who is abusing substance, substances. Now, I know it's no longer lockdown, but I think that the tips still apply. Let's have a look. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Yannette. I am an addictions counsellor at Cape Town Drug Counselling Centre. Cape Town Drug Counselling Centre is an outpatient rehab centre. We provide treatment services to those who want to stop using alcohol and drugs. We also provide supportive services to their families and significant others. Going for counselling can be a terrifying experience. Taking that first step of admitting that you have a problem takes a lot of courage. The purpose of this channel is to provide information to make that first step easier. This channel is all about recovery and choosing change together. So, if you want more info, please like, and subscribe to our channel. Also, leave a comment with topics that you would like to be discussed. Bye bye! Hello, everyone! Welcome! One of our most requested topics are how to cope if you are in lockdown with someone who abuses substances. Being in lockdown is a stressful experience on its own. Being in lockdown with a substance user can make the experience so much more difficult. During the lockdown period, the substance user will likely be unable to use their substance. This means that this person will likely go into a state of withdrawal. During withdrawal, a person might experience mood swings, which could result in anger outbursts, irritability, and higher levels of frustration. Naturally, this will be stressful for everyone at home. As a family member of the substance user, you might also feel stuck, frustrated, and irritated. This could lead to arguments which could potentially turn violent. However, there are several ways to protect yourself. Firstly, try and stay calm and patient with each other. Try some breathing exercises and meditation. However, no one has the right to abuse you in any way. That is why a second recommendation would be to set up boundaries. Setting up clear, consistent and consequential boundaries is another way to protect yourself. We will be releasing a video on setting up boundaries soon. An example of a boundary could be, if you hit me, I will phone the police. It is important that boundaries have consequences and that you follow up on these consequences if your boundary is not respected. Emergency services are still available during the lockdown and will be listed in the description below. Thirdly, you need to take care of yourself. This could mean taking a shower, creating a routine, eating healthy meals 
and reaching out to support. This could mean phoning a friend or family member. There are also online support available, like Alanon and Naranon. Links to their website will be in the description. Lastly, remember that this lockdown period will be challenging. However, it is also an opportunity. An opportunity for you to learn and grow, but also an opportunity for the substance user to start their recovery journey. Thank you for tuning in. For more content like this, please like and subscribe. Until next time, bye bye. Welcome back, you're still watching Mental Health Matters and today we are talking about substance use disorder or addiction it's more commonly known and with us in studio is Ulwetu Matulengwe from the Cape Town Drug Counseling Centre. Ulwetu, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. So Ulwetu, this is a very really important topic. Addiction affects so many different people and there's you know, different narratives about it. Some people understand it as a disorder or illness. Other people attach some stigma. They, say they think it's a choice that you can stop. Um, so I wanted to start with just defining addiction. You know, what is it? Yeah. Um, that's a good question, you know, because there's different explanations, you know, when it comes to addiction. Um, some people would say it's having a weak immorality, having a weak will. Um, others, you know, will boil down to choice, that it's something that a person can just decide and stop. But the reality that we're sitting with is that addiction is um, recognized internationally um, as a disease. So, um, you know, it means that it's something that is incurable um, and it's often very difficult for people people to accept and to acknowledge that, not only for the family, but also for the substance user themselves. Uh, because if you think about it, when the person started using the substances, there wasn't an intent or a plan to be addicted to the substances. Mm. Um, so, but because of its nature, it gets worse over time and develops to being this addiction. Um, so if I can maybe explain a bit more, um, if we look at um, diabetes, right? Diabetes yeah. is a chronic illness um, and a person can still live a good quality of life um, if they do, you know, change their eating habits, um, you know, their lifestyle, exercise, take the medication as prescribed. So the same thing happens, you know, for a person that is using the substances, that it involves a complete lifestyle change in order for them to live a good quality of life. Um, so also like any other addiction um, like any other disease addiction has um, characteristics so the first one it is primary so this means that it becomes the main thing in the person's life so when they wake up in the morning they think about it when they go to bed it's the last thing that they think about it um, and then the second one is that it is progressive so we spoke about that you know that it gets worse over time mm. um, the person can start using with DACA for an example um, and then they can go on you know to other substances maybe like tick or mandrax depending you know in, in terms of that person um, but also it gets worse in terms of the consequences um, so for an example a person that um, maybe like a student um, a learner at school they might get suspended um, at school if they are caught using substances mm. but for an adult it's more of maybe possibly losing your job and there's no financial support that is coming in for yourself or for your family in that regard so it just becomes um, um, you know worse as the time goes by and um, again it is chronic um, there's no cure there's no pill or injection that a person can take in order for them to not be addicted to the substances um, but what's important is that the person can still live a good quality of life if they do change their behavior so they can manage the addiction and the management speaks to um, accessing for an example a treatment facility um, like a rehabilitation center, looking at the person, um, you know, for an example, accessing NA meetings, accessing mm. a sponsor. So those are the different ways that a person can be able to manage their addiction. And um, the last one is terminal. So as we understand, you know, terminal 
speaks to the end point. Um, so a person can either be institutionalized, uh, meaning they can go to hospital or they can end up being at a rehabilitation center. Um, but also a person can be imprisoned because of mm. the lifestyle that they live when they're using substances. And there's also the reality of homelessness um, because of it getting worse over time that some of the consequences would be a person ending up being homeless. And the very last one would be um, death, which is the last straw. And that can also in itself happen in different types of ways. Um, so that's how you know, um, we understand addiction um, as, as a disease. Wow, <laughs> I'm like actually blown away. I have to say, I have never thought of addiction as a chronic disease. Like I just perked up when you said uh, incurable. Yeah. And, um, and so it's just showing sort of a lack of knowledge and communication around this because um, you've just taken me on a whole different track now. Yeah. I want to ask you, so we're speaking about um, addiction as a chronic disease. We also know that it's not just illegal substances that people get addicted to. So they get addicted to, I mean, the easy one is alcohol and cigarettes, yeah. which they can buy. Um, but then also cough medicine or prescription drugs or painkillers. Mm -hmm. And so this applies to all of that. Absolutely. So at the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center, we do, you know, we help people that um, want to stop using substances. And like you said, you know, it doesn't only mean the illicit substances, but also alcohol as well. Um, so people, you know, would um, justify that everyone is drinking alcohol. So it's not mm. really a problem. But if we look at the person individually, we can see that there's a lot of damages and losses that the person is sitting with because of the use of um, those particular substances. The same goes for um, medication as well. That is definitely something a person can also abuse, um, you know, in, in, in terms of um, the, the substance use. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So I've always been fascinated by um, functional addiction, mm. which is what they're called. And I, I, I want to tell the audience, I first learned about this in uh, Standard 7. Mm. One of my teachers said, you can be a weekend alcoholic. So you can, you can not drink it all during the week, but every weekend, if you must drink, if you can't not drink, um, then you are also an alcoholic. And mm. another story I read that, that had a really profound impact on me was, um, I don't remember where, but there was a woman mm -hmm. and she was using a legal substance of painkillers or whatever it was, yes. right? And she was fine, but her husband found out she was using it and gave her an ultimatum. Mm -hmm. So she was doing everything she needed to do, dropping the kids at school, managing the household. She didn't consider herself an addict, but once it was cut off, she was not able to function. Mm. And through that, she lost her marriage, she lost her kids, she lost her home. She started then, um, it progressed to illegal substances because she couldn't get hold of the legal drugs that she was using. So I want to ask whether there is a thing as functional addiction. Mm. Um, when it comes to that, a lot of people, they regard themselves as functional addicts. Um, like you said, you know, they can still be able to go to work, they still have their family, they can still do their daily um, activities. Um, but what happens is that it sends a message, you know, to that person to say that what I'm doing is okay. Mm. You know, at least I'm not like so-and-so who has lost their job. I'm not like the homeless person down the street. Um, it makes it okay, you know, for them to actually continue the substances. And that's where the denial comes into play because it is a defense mechanism that actually enables the person to continue using the substances. So um, they make all sorts of excuses and it comes in different um, forms and shapes. But the minute a person minimizes and compares themselves to others, um, making their problem less, what we don't see in the background is the person is actually continuing with the substances. And if you remember, we said it is progressive. Mm. So it means that they, when they continue to minimize, they continue to deny the reality of their using, it will get worse. And people will now only realize when they're on the brink, you know, of losing everything or when they've actually lost everything. So it just, it's feed, the, the, the denial feeds off of that, mm -hmm. that the person makes their problem less than it seems and constantly just compares themselves with the person that they regard as worse than they are. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And the excuse is probably always in the beginning, well, you know, I'm fine and mm. nothing has happened yet. Yeah. I want to ask then, you know, for people holding that mindset, um, 
what does progression look like? And so someone might be completely fine. What should they know about progression? Mm, mm, mm. So in terms of that, oh, sorry, yeah. And I wanted to add in, so there is a narrative where uh, they call it chasing the dragon. So mm. if we do the lingo, so you, you do take a drug and you get high or what gives you whatever sort of effect you're going to have. And some of the language around progression that I have heard is that now you've got to take more and more and more to sort of get the same effect. And does that happen? Is that part of the progression cycle? Yes, absolutely. So um, that also speaks to the tolerance, you know, that a person might start off using the substance um, again, you know, maybe DACA, because that's what um, we've found that a lot of people would initially start using with DACA. But again, mm. it is different from person to person. So um, with, you know, starting with it, a person would it would go maybe from using once a week to on a daily basis and they would feel like the DACA is not giving them that same high mm. and they would look for another substance that will actually give them the high that they're looking for. It's um, something that is never really satisfied. So they just, again, chasing that dragon that they never really um, actually reach. So that progressiveness goes in that sense as well, that a person might, again, make excuses. You know, they might start making errors at work, but they will say, no, but I just maybe had a bad day. Mm. But if that now continues to being on a daily basis, being called for discipline plenary hearings and all of that. So it slowly becomes progressive as the time goes and people only don't realize or acknowledge until it is very much visible to everyone else that there is a problem that's there. Thank you. I mean, um, and so that's, that's really important also, I guess, for us to, to understand, to maybe break through, break through the measure of control that they think they have. I wanted to ask you, so the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center, and I'm going to ask you about some of the services that you do, but I know what was really interesting for me is that you are an outpatient rehab. Yes. Okay, so tell us, I didn't know there were such things as outpatient rehab, so mm -hmm. maybe tell us about that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> outpatient um, means that the person doesn't stay within the facility. Um, so the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center is an outpatient. Our clients would attend sessions um, during the day and go back home or go back to their work and all of those things. So with outpatient, it's something really that people are not necessarily aware of because when we think rehab, we immediately think about inpatient. Mm. Um, however, there is um, outpatient services that a person can access. And this gives a person, you know, an opportunity to actually um, practice or put in those tools that they learn from the center. So because they still face with their family, they still face with the community, they can still have those advantages of having their work, of going to school. Um, unlike outpatient whereby a person would be in there for a duration of time. So the outpatient really just gives a person that chance um, to actually practice and to work on their recovery actively on a daily basis. Um, and then also when we now look at inpatient, then it's where the person would be um, staying in and again it works from person to person um, you know and people really would initially say inpatient this is what I'm looking for but we also have to educate when the calls come into our center as well that there are other options of um, a person actually accessing treatment. Yes and then I think when I spoke to you guys to sort of book this it was also that the person sometimes the person's working mm. and so they can still sort of maintain their job. I, I'm gonna come back to like what um, inpatient rehab looks like but I also wanted to ask you about you know we were speaking about sort of what addiction is and progression and addiction as a chronic disease I watched an episode of seventh heaven many many years ago this was part of the reason that I was afraid <laughs> to touch substances when I was young um, illegal substances um, and what the father in this case had caught the daughter with marijuana mm -hmm. and he said to her, you know, the danger with drugs is you don't know what your susceptibility is. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a different level of tolerance. Yes. And when I was young, there were people around me um, and I can see now in hindsight that we're using it as recreationally mm -hmm. and the kids go through this phase. Um, the majority of them were fine and went on and could leave it and could use it only rec recreationally. Mm -hmm. There was a subset who then tipped mm -hmm. over. And so I wanted to ask, is susceptibility a thing? Are more people susceptible to substance abuse than others? And what are those factors? Yes. Um, so we also look at, you know, um, the 
person's family system. Those are one of the things that we do explore um, in terms of is there any family member that you've had, you know, that has had a substance use or a mental health um, um, disorder. So just to get that background, because what happens is that um, it does have an impact. You know, there's a gene that is um, carried, you know, from uh, possibly carried from people um, within the same family. So let's say, for an example, your um, father has had a substance use problem. It does not guarantee that mm. you will have a substance abuse problem. What it actually means is that if you would use substances, there's more chance that you would be actually addicted to the substance because of that particular gene that actually is transferred from one generation to the next. So that's why we find that sometimes even the substance users themselves, they see their friends, you know, but this person can still drink and everything is all fine mm. themselves. But why me? So that also in itself, you know, envying the other people that are actually continuing with the substance, it actually makes it very difficult for them to focus on their journey and to also acknowledge that they're different, you know, from the person that is next to them. So what we usually say, you know, acknowledge that, that yes, I can see my friends are, um, are still using and um, I would like to be like them, but I can see what the substances are doing in their lives. And I know if I continue using, there's further loss that is going to happen. So um, definitely in terms of, um, you know, people being, um, um, subsistence, um, being challenged, you know, in terms of um, the substances moving again from one um, generation to the next is something that is, is possible. I think I think that's great to know and also I think um, it brings it down to sort of what is the individualized effect and so it's not the same for everyone mm -hmm. and I think also you know again just thinking back um, thinking back to when I was younger and people that I knew that used consequences are different mm -hmm. for everyone like you were saying some someone will lose their job but they can't afford to lose their job mm -hmm. where someone else could stay in their parents home and not be working and just like have that um, type of security mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask also, so when they go into outpatient rehab, what does that sort of look like? What is the framework there? Is it counseling? You know, because you were saying, most people don't know about it. All I can think about is the movies that I watched yeah. where someone has gone in and stayed there and it looks like a medical facility. Mm. Uh, what does outpatient rehab look like? Mm. So with outpatient, um, it is counselling. So a person receives counselling. Um, so this is, again, where we start with an assessment, um, you know, just to get a brief um, background and understanding of what has been happening, how have other um, areas of this person been affected by the substances. And then the person will be booked into the program Program, you know, attending sessions um, on a weekly basis, depending on that particular organization. But for us at the Cape Town Dark Counseling Center, our clients, our adult clients, they attend three sessions per week. And then for our adolescents clients, they attend two sessions per week. So it's basically um, accessing psychoeducational um, um, counseling as well in terms of what addiction is. Okay, and then are there sort of, is there group counselling as well? And I know many years ago there was uh, acupuncture and some other alternative type of stuff offered. Mm. Does that sort of play into it? Still? Yes. So so now, um, so the Cape Town Dark Counseling Centre um, is a non-profit organisation. Um, so, you know, funding is a challenge. It yeah. continues being a challenge. Um, so we've had to phase away, you know, certain services um, like the acupuncture and all of that. So what we have now, we have, um, you know, people accessing individual sessions, group sessions, as well as lectures. So those are the things that we have at the moment. And we do have, you know, some exciting opportunities that are coming in looking at um, doing meditation you mm -hmm. know offering meditation to our clients um, anger management and all those types of things because mindfulness um, is also you know um, quite important for people that are using um, substances but for anyone in general so those are the services that we we have at the moment um, and then we have um, family support as well within that mix yes and I'm glad yeah. you mentioned family support because that's something I really want to go into um, and I think it's great also that you're mentioning sort of mindfulness because the other side of it, I mean, aside from the susceptibility, is we know that substances are often used to numb emotions. And we're looking at, you know, the effect of sort of mental health issues or being overwhelmed or having anger. Mm -hmm. And so uh, alcohol especially is a, mm -hmm. is a big sort of uh, substance to use that. But we need to take a short break quickly yeah. and we'll be back with more after this.
Welcome back. You're still watching Mental Health Matters and we are speaking about substance use disorder or addiction as it's more commonly known. And with us in studio is Olbetu Matulengwe from the Cape Town Drug Counseling Centre and we are having an absolutely fascinating conversation. I am learning so many new things. Yeah. Olbetu, before the break, you were speaking about the services provided by the Cape Town Drug Counseling Centre, which is an outpatient rehab, so people don't stay there. Um, and you ended off there by saying you also provide services to family. And mm -hmm. this is really a topic I wanted to get into. I think that there's not enough sort of um, information around how do the people around the person who is abusing a substance uh, manage, you know, what the experience is like for them. Um, so tell us about what kind of work you do with the family at the center um, and some of the things that come out in terms of what the experience is like for family members and in relationships. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so for family, their journey starts with um, the person that's using the substances. So initially from the day of assessment, the family member needs to be there um, because we start with a drug test um, and they need to be there in terms of administering the test, but also in terms of supporting and giving some collateral information, uh, sharing their concerns, their expectations out of the program. And and throughout the course, you know, we do random drug tests every second week um, with our clients and the family needs to be present in those instances. Um, and we also have family sessions as well. So family sessions, you know, we invite the, 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 the family, we invite the substance user, we look at any concerns, you know, that might have come up during the course of the treatment, but also to check how are things going. Mm. So family is a very important part, you know, of um, this journey because they too are affected by the substance substance use. So their role is just, you know, um, being present in, in all that process. But also they we understand that there's two journeys, you know, there's the journey of the substance user and then there's the journey of the family. They can work parallel to, it, to each other, but mm. they will never meet. So it's very important that the family as well does access support. So in terms of the family, then we have family workshop. So this is a, um, a, a workshop that takes place once every month. It is a half day workshop so we invite family members that are not using any substances if they've had a substance use um, disorder before they need to be at least two years clean mm. so this is whereby we break it down you know what is addiction so we give all of those different characteristics the symptoms because we said it is a disease and then we also look at what role am I playing as the family member because there's different problematic roles that I am playing for an example enabling the using you know what type of behavior that is actually not helping in the in the addiction and we also look at boundaries you know how can I be able to set boundaries what what do I need to put in place in order to ensure that I have structured and solid boundaries going forward so family is a very very important part um, of this process but also as the substance user is affected they too are affected so they do need treatment as well this is such an important topic and I, you know, before the show, always I was telling you the way I found out about the Cape Town Drug yes. Counseling Centre is that someone close to me had um, a substance use disorder, and so I was fascinated by the work that you uh, that your organisation does with families. And I wanted to sort of bring in, and I think just to validate those experiences, some of the things. So I attended a family workshop, mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that really uh, stayed with me. One was that it was it was extremely validating and healing. I think to be amongst people who are experiencing the same things. Yeah. And if I may just give one or two examples that came out, because I want to speak about the type of disruption that yeah. substance use disorder or substance abuse like has within the family yeah. and what that looks like. So two examples that I came across was um, there was a father, his son was abusing substances. And so they would, they would try to address it, but often he would initiate conflict between his parents mm -hmm. so that the attention is now off of him and his parents are arguing. It doesn't matter that it's... Um, you know, it's something negative and, and it's hurting the other people. All his main aim was to sort of get the attention off of him. Mm. And then there was a woman whose brother was a substance uh, abuser and she owned a shop. She owned a, a shop and one of the things she said is she would set a boundary that she wouldn't give him money, but he'd come into the shop and make a scene mm. and essentially force her to give him some money so that the you know she could uh, he could leave and he wouldn't disrupt the counselors so i wanted to ask about that type of behavior mm -hmm. and whether that you know these are common things that come through 
there are people at home possibly dealing with this feeling a lot of pain and I think trauma and they can't mm. understand how someone can hurt them this way and mm. do these hurtful things to them. And I think, I guess what I'm asking is for some context around that. Yes. Um, so when that dynamic starts happening, it speaks to those problematic roles um, that, you know, we see, we, we usually um, have a diagram of a triangle that is, that has a slit, you know, um, just a cut um, at, at the bottom. Mm. So the top part, there's the victim there. And usually the substance user usually takes the role of the victim. So feeling sorry for themselves poor me you know I am not loved I'm not cared for and all of those things and then we have um, at the bottom the rescuer the rescuer would be maybe even the dad or the mother it depends mm. so the rescuer is a person that wants to always be a hero you know they just want to help this person mm. they want to do every single thing you know to actually help this person and then the last person we have a, a persecutor the persecutor now is a person that wants to punish the addiction away whereas the rescuer wants to love the addiction away and both of these roles they are not being helpful because the rescuer says you know says to the victim that you can't do things for yourself you need mommy to do things for you you need mommy to pay your rent you need dad to do to do this for you but then the other one is just straight up punishing and setting threats and all of those things and that gives the user a reason to actually continue using because what he's going to say that it's because you made me angry it's because you did this to me therefore that's why I'm using substances so it just becomes a whole mess and it what it does it actually puts the substance user and their family on opposite ends mm. and once the victim and the persecutor start fighting the victim just slips away that crack nobody is is, is actually paying attention to them because the conflict now is happening between either mom or dad or uncle or aunt depending on who is in the family system so definitely the family you know there is a role that they play they do get affected as well within um, this journey and the substance user will always you know want to blame they will always want to say something shame the person blame the person to 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 relieve the focus from actually being on them mm -hmm. and it, it, it just becomes a blame and shame seesaw that's what yeah. we usually call it yeah I mean, that sounds, that sounds so accurate and um, so hard, and yeah. it is hard. I want to say, I always say one of the most powerful things that I learned um, interacting with the Cape Town Drug Counseling Center was the notion of consequences. Yes. And so um, one of the things that was said, and which I will say I have used not just within this context, but I find across the board with everybody, even now my daughter, is don't threaten something that you're not going to follow through on. So whether, when it's a romantic relationship, don't say, I'm going to leave, and then you don't leave. And what this teaches the other person is that your threats are empty mm. and they can just keep doing what they're doing because there's no consequences. Yeah. So um, tell us about that. Yes, so definitely, you know, boundaries are very, very important. And we acknowledge that it's very difficult to set boundaries in Initially, because it's probably something that we're not used to doing uh, but also because of the reality of setting boundaries that it's something that is um, you know not easy but with consistency then it becomes easier as you go so we when we look at one of the important things you know for family to keep in mind is that a boundary needs to be clear so you need to set it you know if you're saying that um, um, you have a curfew you know of eight o'clock and nobody is going to come in the house after eight o'clock if you set that boundary boundary you stick to it and the person that's using the drugs also needs to know that this is a specific boundary that is set at home and then also it needs to be um, consequential you know they need to understand that if you do come late and the gate is closed then you will just have to find your own place you know where to sleep I'm not going to open up for you get up at night and open up for you so it needs to have specific consequences like you said if, if, if it's a threat it means that I'm not going to follow through with it I'm mm. just gonna keep saying things just to scare you off but in reality I know that I'm not gonna follow through with that and also another thing you know it needs to be consistent every single day of every single hour the family needs to put those um, specific boundaries as difficult as it is that you need to always be consistent um, 
and then also another thing, it needs to be something, you know, that um, the family actually sit. You know, if in the family there's, um, there's aunt, there's uncle, there's dad involved, you need to sit with everyone to tell them that this is a boundary, you know, that I would like us to set. Mm. Have that open communication because what the substance user does, they would go to mommy, mommy, can you please give me 50 rand? And then mom will say, no, I'm not going to give you the 50 rand. I don't have money and all of that. I'm not going to support you using. But they go to dad. Daddy, can you please give me 50 rand? And, and daddy will say, okay, it's fine. You can take it, but don't tell mom. So what it does, it just causes a breakdown within the family system. So everyone needs to know that this is a boundary, this is the consequence, and this person needs to understand that I don't have anyone that I can run to mm. within the house because we have a strong unity in terms of setting those boundaries. Um, and you know, we, we also acknowledge that with setting these boundaries, we might um, fall, you know, initially. We might break the boundary, we might, it might end up being a threat, but if you wake up again tomorrow, you try again, the longer that you practice it, then it becomes more easier for you to actually stick to the boundaries that you've set. Yes, and that's what, yeah. I, that's what I wanted to ask about, because yeah. when you were saying things like, I'm going to lock the door, yeah. and that's it, I was like, I, was like, I couldn't mm. really feel the anxiety yeah. sort of rising up, right? And so, also I think what's important is to then choose boundaries that um, I remember that's how I was thinking that that you are comfortable or able to follow through with. So, uh, for instance, uh, I one of the things I did was like, okay, well, you you if you use, then I'll drive you to work and back mm. um, because you know those are the op you know those mm. are the opportunities to up around when to buy. Yes, yes. Um, and so, just choosing those boundaries, and I think not to feel bad. So I li mm. really like that you said that not to feel bad if you fail on a boundary, but to just get up and try again. Um, yeah. the next morning. I would just speak about the blame and shame mm -hmm. um, cycle. There's still so much stigma around um, substance abuse. And yeah. so we are ashamed of it as family members. We are ashamed of it. We see it as a weakness in the family, a weak yes. link in the family. Um, but the reality is, is that with something like this, there is judgment, mm. right? Is that one of the things that comes through for people? And I, I really want to ask like, what your advice is to families who struggle with who, you know, you're saying it's important to get the whole family involved. Obviously, mm -hmm. uncle, auntie, or mm -hmm. brother and sister must know if this boundary is in place, mm -hmm. then they shouldn't go drive yes. um, the person somewhere, not intentionally or enabling, but because they don't know. So mm -hmm. it's important to let everybody know. Mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the issues that come up? Are people, do people say, like, I just can't? People are so rigid about the reputation. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. the advice that you give to people around that? Yes. Um, so when it comes to, um, you know, this shame that you talking about it's um, the reality that we're sitting with you know addiction is a shame based disease and it impacts a lot of um, the lives of the user and also for their family as well so um, sometimes you know you'd find that um, the person would even be ashamed to access treatment um, but that's why it's important for us to involve the family from the start to create a safe environment you know for them to actually speak about addiction because in most households it's something that we don't speak about Mm. We know that it's happening, but we don't really talk about it. So we give an opportunity to actually um, have a space, you know, that we can talk about that. And, you know, as difficult as it is, um, we encourage, you know, accessing support. Accessing support, if you're not maybe comfortable talking about it with your family, that you can be able to access support, you know, maybe speaking to a professional to actually um, talk about this addiction and the impact that it, it, it's having on your life. So that's what, you know, we, we would um, encourage encourage uh, people to do. Thank you. I, I also want to ask, like, so when we speak about also these things that are these behavior, painful behaviors, like it's lots of betrayal. We know some of the stories around theft often starts first in the home. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of manipulation. So I guess one question, you know, when someone is in the throes of an addiction, someone else or the people around this person who love this person mm -hmm. might ask, can they not see mm. the pain that they are causing? And we understand, yes. And so, so sometimes I think it's really centralized. We see this person and this person has got this addiction problem and we try to be there and support them. But when that behavior spills over into specifically hurting the rest of the people, like um, disabling, getting them fired, yeah. um, stealing stuff from the home, stealing hard-earned money. I know some of the stories in books that I've read, there was a mother 
uh, and, and I'll say the story because I did it. I, I'm remembering now this mother, her son was an addict and she was using a butter knife mm. to cut the onions for supper mm. because he had stolen all of the cutlery. Mm. And so she's in this like already this hopeless space um, and he laughs at her. He's like, how can you be cutting the onions with a butter knife? And he's actually making fun of her, even though he's the one who stole um, mm. all the cutlery. And she actually stabbed him with a butter knife, if I'm remembering correctly. This mm. book is out. Uh, it was published. This yeah. was one of the stories. I really think this is a question that people want to ask. Can they see? Are they, are they, or is their brain function disrupted? Do they not realize their the pain that their behavior is causing. Yes, yes. Um, and that is something, you know, that you find very common in um, family members. Um, that frustration, you know, around, you can see everything is happening. You know, we can see the hurt, we can see the pain that it's causing, but why aren't you stopping? Mm. So it is very difficult, you know, for families to um, go through that, um, go through those emotions. And again, if we remember, the person that's using the substances, they wrapped up in their own reality. They are in denial, you know, of the substance use. Again, they believe that they don't have a problem. They continuously to blame other people, shifting the responsibility, you know, from themselves. So also again, now for the family, it is very important for the family to understand that addiction is a chronic illness or rather a disease that no one has control over. Mm. The substance user does not have the control over the use of substances, the same as the family does not have control over what they do or what they say. So when you, know, when you start acknowledging and accepting that, then that's the first step for the family to actually access support. When you realize that this is something that I cannot control, I can try to support this person, but I won't be able to take all the responsibility. I can't tell them to stop the substances. It is solely their responsibility in mm. terms of what they want to do. And um, again, you know, when the family realizes that, you know, when we um, process that with them, there's a lot of feelings of helplessness mm. because again, nobody wants to see their son, nobody wants to see their family member um, go through addiction. And they start blaming themselves, you know, maybe if I had loved them more, maybe if I had been present more, maybe, you know, if I do this, if I do that, start questioning, you know, their parental role um, and, and responsibilities. But all of that plays into the addiction itself. Mm -hmm. But when you acknowledge and you accept that I don't have control over it, that is a strength that you can be able to use for you to access treatment or support in that regard. Anyway, can we think also that, you know, uh, playing sort of the blame game and the self-blame game yeah. really feeds into that. Just when you talked about the blame and shame mm -hmm. cycle and you talked about the type of things that they say, I, um, you made me do yes. it, or if only you would give me money, then I mm -hmm. wouldn't steal all of your stuff. Um, that sort of feeds into that insecurity that a lot of them have, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so... Um, and so we wanted to ask, so what are some of the ways that uh, that parents and I think family members then can, you know, is it important for them also to do things like me uh, meditation, be aware of themselves, mm. or be aware of the feelings that mm. they are mm. experiencing? Yes. No, absolutely. Um, because like we said, you know, addiction is a shame-based disease, but also it is very much a family disease. So it doesn't only affect the user, but also the family as well. So what happens is that during the cycle of addiction, it, it forms a pattern, a disruptive um, pattern to everyone's life. So what we usually see is that the family starts now mirroring the behavior of the user. So for a person using the drugs, they, um, they sleeping and eating patterns, they disrupt it. And you find yourself as the parent or as the family member, you struggle to sleep. Um, you all, always constantly thinking about this person. You no longer eat, you no longer take care of yourself. Mm. So because your life revolves around this person, then you start taking on some of the behaviors that they actually present. And families usually don't see it unless you actually reflect it to them. Because again, the focus, the primary focus is always on the person that's using the substances. And the family doesn't see that they're also getting hurt um, during that time as well. So 
So it is very much important that they do access, um, get support as well. Um, access counseling, you know, like we said before, that the Cape Town Dark Counseling Center does offer, you know, family support, um, but also a person can even access, you know, private um, therapy as well yeah. to try and um, help themselves to build themselves up because they have very much been affected by the using as well. Wow, all the way to like that, I think is so important. Yeah. And you know, the fact that you say you can't see it when you're in it, mm -hmm. just shows the importance of um, seeking help yeah. elsewhere, going into counseling so that you are able to speak about it and in speaking about it, able to deflect, sort of see mm -hmm. the patterns, because we don't see the patterns. Yeah. Um, this is such an interesting conversation, but we have to take a short break and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching Mental Health Matters and we're speaking about substance disuse, uh, substance misuse disorder and um, or addiction as we know to call it. And we are still in studio with Olwetu Matulengwe from the Cape Town Drug Counseling Centre and we are learning so much about addiction, so many things that I didn't know about. And I think um, Olwetu, what I want to just us to end off with is you know, this is such a huge issue. We've spoken about all of the different ways that um, this disorder can manifest in our families mm -hmm. and the conflict it can cause and how difficult it is and that we need to set boundaries. And so I just wanted to end off with like, how can we, how can we be of support then? It just, it seems so huge. Um, what are the things that we can do to be, to, to be supportive and to, I think, contribute to them managing? So again, you know, it's a chronic disease, not overcoming to them managing this disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Um, and it's a good thing, you know, just to clarify that because sometimes people will think um, if they access a treatment, you know, after the six weeks, um, then all is good, you know, I'm done, I can go back to my normal life. But addiction is a lifelong illness. So it requires a person to be in this process, you know, um, lifelong of changing their lives. But um, in terms of, you know, the family, um, these are things, sometimes when you think of support, we think about big things, you know, what can I do? What can I try to um, help this person? But by merely accessing support for yourself first, that is also how the person that's using the substances because you get an understanding of the role that you're playing and then now you understand that I shouldn't rescue this person but I should support this person I should set boundaries I should you know cut um, have limitations and all of that that is actually going to help them mm -hmm. because we cannot control what they do but we can simply manage ourselves so that is how we can actually support them because when they realize that now there's no longer anyone that is going to rescue me from this situation now the spotlight it goes back to the substance user and it actually forces them to work on their recovery process so that's um, one way you know of actually supporting um, but also you know in terms of um, us as well um, getting you know um, ongoing support for the person that's using the substances because supporting sometimes it doesn't involve necessarily, you know, uh, maybe paying things for them and all of that. You can set a boundary to say, I am going to maybe drive you to the center, um, but you have the responsibility, you know, to actually ensure that you remember your appointments, make mm. sure that you're there on time. So really giving them that responsibility. That is how we do support the person that's using the substances. And I must say, you know, it's very difficult because yeah. it comes back to the boundaries, that some boundaries can be extremely challenging for us to even think about um, you know for an example saying I'm not going to pay your rent this month um, you have to take care of those responsibilities that is you supporting that person that is you helping that person and you are allowing them to have an opportunity to actually feel the consequences of their behavior and if they now feel the consequence it gives them an opportunity as well to really look at you know the type of life that they're living yeah I love that you're speaking about boundaries because we've spoken about boundaries sort of in in a broader sense in yeah. general people yeah. are speaking a lot about boundaries not just within sort of you know substance misuse but just in our general life mm -hmm. in this busy life that we have now and one of the things that I always struggled with is that when you set the boundary there will be backlash the things that yes. you are afraid are gonna happen are actually going to happen mm -hmm. so they mm -hmm. are gonna call you selfish or they are gonna mm -hmm. accuse you of 
uh, not supporting mm -hmm. them. And they are going to, you know, maybe say they hate you mm -hmm. or that uh, this is a big one. Oh, you've changed mm -hmm. because maybe you've always done those yes. things, right? You've always been the helper in all, all of these other mm -hmm. ways. And now all of a sudden you're rude and, you know, all the things. So I wanted to ask you, and you said, you know, one of the important things is making sure that you have support for yourself so that mm -hmm. you're strong enough to be able to do all of those things. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, family members or those supporting uh, the person with a substance use disorder mm -hmm. can um, can look at? What are some of the small ways that we can look after ourselves mm -hmm. and our mental health? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I think, you know, when it comes to um, addiction and taking care of ourselves as the family, again, it speaks to the boundaries. Again, you know, this is a conversation mm -hmm. that just keeps coming back up all the time because it speaks to, you know, putting those certain limitations in terms of your life, in terms of your space. Mm -hmm. So for an example, if you know that you have set, you know, specific boundaries, then that gives you a um, peace of mind you know mm. because you understand that it's not about punishing this person but it's actually about protecting you yeah. because for a very long time you were with them you know within this um, um this disruptive cycle but now you're removing yourself from the cycle and taking care of yourself and that you do through those um particular boundaries so you know with taking care of yourself sometimes the things that you would um you you've done before you know to take care of yourself you go back to those things you ensure maybe you take some walks um mm. you know you see friends, you speak to people, you don't bottle things up inside, um, you eat healthy, you know, and you just manage yourself in that sense. So those are the things that a person can actually do. And sometimes it can really seem like small things, but they actually do speak volumes because you immediately see, you know, because you see the change, you know, as you continue to put those boundaries, as you continue to take care of yourself, then you start seeing those changes um, in yourself as well. And when they start saying, you've changed, Changed, that is actually a message to you telling you that your method is working ah, because now they can that. see that you know you're not the same person anymore yeah, yeah. And, we, and we shouldn't because same hasn't worked before and you know I love that you're putting emphasis on sort of getting out and that um, not isolating oneself yes. right because if I'm thinking back to what you said earlier about how you know we can murder Mm. sort of the user's behavior mm. one of those things is like isolating ourselves is that mm. shame cycle we don't want to go out we don't want to talk about it and so we stay inside and and that also and by doing that it's also i think um removing yourself from the situation for a while mm. so you can't also sit consistently with this conflict mm. i think you know i i am actually thinking also maybe one of the things is um not feeling like we deserve to have a life outside mm. of this addiction because this is mm. this big thing not feeling like we deserve or are entitled to go out and actually have some fun and laugh when somebody is going through something this big mm. but I and, and so I really want to thank you for sort of bringing that up and to uh, give people that permission mm. to be able to look after themselves mm. as they're going through it and that's mm. really all the time we have uh, <laughs> all we have time for mm. today all we have time, I just want to say thank you so very much to yourself it's a Cape Town drug counseling center they are based in observatory and they do outpatient rehab providing services to people with substance use disorders and families yes. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of the show. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lenina Rasul. Goodbye.